Yeah, he's all right. All right. You want the council to be on the board of ed are tasked with crafting a budget that will take into account the hardships that many of our citizens now face, balancing against and providing the children of Danbury quality education, one that will not rob them of their ability to earn a living and live comfortably in the future. Last year, we worked effectively with our appropriations from the city, and we were able to mitigate much of the impact of the quality of the service we provide to our children for one one time plus avoidance in the United States, which we have discussed at many of our workshops. But as we have discussed with those members of the council who attended those workshops, which began back in late fall, those savings are no longer available to us as options for this year. Last year we worked with the zero increase and are now working with the mayor's proposal of a 1.79% increase over the last year's budget. When you look at that, over two years represents a 0.9% increase for each year. It's hard to believe that with approximately 80% of our operational costs tied up to salaries and benefits, that we have not seen a major impact on our ability to deliver, to deliver a quality education that is neighborhood residents are accustomed to having in their schools. So we have restructured and worked to find an out-of-the-box solutions to, to the problems we have faced. And to this point, we have, we have been successful. Our finance director, Bill Longo, has provided all of us at our workshop meetings a long list of areas where we have cut costs and we're going to continue to look for further increase operating efficiency and further reduce costs. In this economy, the, my opinion is that the mayor's budget proposal is both fair and equitable. We thank him for his concern for the children of Danbury and we're working hard to putting together a fair budget that balances the needs of the system against the taxpayers' ability to pay and support the budget. Thank you. Not to be redundant, but what well, we're going to try to do tonight is have a PowerPoint that people have a top there. We try to go through some questions, and then we have a revised um, budget recommendation that we've discussed with the board, and that's the subcommittee board. So maybe we could go through that and then uh, answer questions that you may have. Okay, that sound you. Sure. Uh, Bill was not here, Dr. West was not here last week. We're going to go through the, through the um, slideshow first and then look to the financials at the end. If you look at the end of that packet, you'll find the financials that will culminate in the presentation. Bill? Good evening, everybody. It's good to see you. And thank you for the fiber tax. It's been a good life of playing to you the end. A lot of schools, nine schools, just need to have that fiber capability. We now have this all set. Uh, it will give us a far greater opportunity for our children to really have the kind of uh, experiences that are pretty much the most. We should want to start by saying thank you. Um, I apologize for anybody I'm um, standing in front of the screen to see the parking movers. I'll try to let them a little bit there. Um, we just start with this with shock because um, while we're all adults here tonight, um, the school folks, we're all about kids. And we always want to use it as a backdrop. Um, why are we having this session tonight? I appreciate the opportunity to come in front of you. And it's critical for us because there are some myths out there that we have perpetuated one reason or another, uh, and there are a lot of inaccuracies. What we're really trying to do is clarify uh, our fiscal work on behalf of our 10,500 kids. Um, one of the pictures of Danbury High School, one of the most culturally diverse schools in Connecticut. Um, true or false, last year's 0% allocation did not make an impact on the ability to educate students. And it's a great question, and people have uh, bounces back and forth. We understand that. Uh, we had a 0% uh, allocation. Uh, we took that and did our due diligence through the processes that we always use. Our intent was to try make this as transparent as possible for children and families. But in fact, uh, it did have a significant uh, impact on us. When we couple the loss of our early reading success program, which was a state grant, when you couple the early reading success grant that was sunsetted um, and the 0% uh, allocation, this is what happened. Let me see how the hearing on this. We lost 17 elementary reading teachers. These are folks that were providing direct services for children on a daily basis in all 14 of our elementary schools. At the same time, we also lost 2.5, and we talked in terms of full time equivalent 17 years. The equivalent of 2.5 elementary teachers, the elimination of 18.7 teachers between the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade levels, 
we cut 3.2 administrators, well, uh, one support staff, nine non-certified staff, the total of 51.4 positions that we lost. There's a misnomer out there. Folks think that there was no impact whatsoever. In part because we offered our building retirement incentive program, the EREP program, we were able to absorb a lot of the folks whose positions were cut because we had so many people retiring. So the net total, we only had two people that actually lost their jobs. We eliminated them through reduction in force. But in reality, 51.4 positions, a little over 51 positions, were actually lost in schools. And again, you can see the cultural diversity that we have. At any given day, we're between 42 and 50 languages spoken just at the high school. True or false, history has, has experienced a remarkable degree of growth in student achievement levels during the past four years. When we talk in terms of trend data, the one year up, the one year down really doesn't make much of a difference. But over time, it's kind of like the stock market, we're hoping that goes up instead of going down. Um, the fact of the matter is that we have had substantial growth. The Connecticut Mastery Test is the state assessment that's given in grades 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And we've had significant growth. I mean, we're more than happy to talk about. I think Mr. Longo gave the uh, council members a handout some time back. We had growth in reading, we had growth in writing, we had growth in mathematics, all three areas that are tested. We had growth at every grade level, and we had growth in every school, from the third grade all the way through to the eighth grade. At the high school level, our most sophisticated, the hardest, the most rigorous assessment that we have is the AP assessment, the advanced placement. It's not a locally crafted or state crafted assessment. It's a national assessment, so it's nationally known, meaning we can't dumb down the test so we look a little bit better. That's a national <laughs> test. We have substantially increased the number of kids taking the test. As a matter of fact, about five years ago, only 54% of the students taking the AP test. We're taking AP classes now. For the past year, we have 100% of our students in AP taking the AP test. Secondly, we went from about 250 to about 450 kids in AP courses. And as you go from the most academically gifted out in concentric circles, what typically happens is your AP scores go down. Because these are kids who traditionally have not had that kind of preparation to really allow them to be in that arena. In fact, our scores have been stable. And the highest level score, the fives, have actually gone up over that period of time. Um, happy campers, which is what we like to do with our climate. True or false, the board's recommended 3.8 that you heard Mr. Fox talk about, and the mayor's recommended 1.8 allocation, 1.8% allocation will have minimal impact on the district's ability to educate students. Before we go on, um, as we go on, <laughs> before we go on, I just want to also reiterate, we're here and, and hopefully uh, what is perceived as a very respectful uh, position. We recognize the work that you folks are doing and the fact that you're doing a lot in the hard place. You have all the departments coming and banging at the walls here saying, at least these are more fire, these are more public schools, more education in school. That as a taxpayer, as a parent, um, as an educator, um, as a voter, I understand all those things. There's anybody in the room that doesn't. So we recognize how hard this is for you. We try, as I said, to do our due diligence. Um, we came in at 3.8% because we felt that that was what was needed to do the least amount of damage. We also recognize that the best the city could do is 1.8%. And as Mr. Fazio said and Mr. Fox said, we're grateful for that and we're trying to do our very best to make it work. But we want to make sure that everybody recognizes that there will be substantial a substantial impact on our school system. The school system that we have today is not going to be the school system that we have next year. We're backsliding clearly. We're going to start looking more like larger ones instead of one of the medium sized ones, the Bridge Post, the Harpers, and the Gables, and the Gables. And you'll see why in a minute. Either allocation will result in severe cuts to program services and staff. And we try to frame these out for you uh, in a way that makes sense. With our 3.81%, um, allocation for the 2010-2011 school year. When we were going in, as we presented this to the city, we would uh, eliminate one elementary teacher. It, it looks modest and it relatively is. It's our elementary gifted program. Elimination of four secondary teachers defined by teachers between the, the grade levels of 6 through 12. Elimination of 2.4 administrators, one non-certified staff, a total cut of 8.4. 
Um, it's hard to tell from here. We have other handouts that we can give you at a later point in time. There is a disproportionate number of administrators who make more cuts at the administrative level than we have at any other level. Um, and we only, it looks like we're only cutting 2.4, but we only have approximately 50 people versus 800 people. A cut like that is, um, percentage-wise, significant. We're also experiencing, experiencing a reduction of funding for our custodial services. There are constant concerns about the buildings not being clean enough. We recognize that. Uh, we're going to be more challenged next year because of that. Our professional development budget, um, at one point, I know that it was thinking on the council's part that we got three, three million dollars a year for professional development. We weren't really sure how that came about. We got 180 thousand dollars a year, but there will be. We've already cut 55 thousand dollars out of that, and our gifted program, known as the summit program, as well. That is what we requested, and those are the cuts that we have proposed internally through multiple scenarios. The reality is, if it stays at 1.8%, this is what we're actually looking at for next year. In July 1, we will have an elimination of 26.7 teachers, another 2.4 administrators, 16 non-certified staff, for a total of 46 and change, 46 of our employees. In this case, probably will be jobs. There is no employee retirement center program, so there's no place for those folks to go. But we have folks that need to return to each other to come back, folks who relocate out of the district or out of the state. We hopefully will be able to absorb some of those. But as of today, what we're looking at is a net reduction of 46 of our employees. Um, our Even Start program, reduction of funding, that's really an elimination of it. Even Start is for those young ladies who had children. We bring them back so they won't become dropouts. We have early childhood and daycare programs for the children and at the same time, we educate those young women so they graduate. That program is going to be eliminated. Closing the school is Blue Ridge Intermediate. Um, closing and then retrofitting. Elimination of special subject program at the middle school. And you'll see this is substantial. And electives at the high school level as well. The overall impact, and this is probably the most important piece to see. Um, between 2008 and 2011, so last year, this year, and next year, there will be substantial reductions in direct services to students in the area of literacy and through our gifted program. We're going to have increased class sizes at the elementary level. Additionally, at the K-2 level, it was 20 kids per class, and at 3-5, it was 25 kids per class. This year, we went K-1 at 22, and 2-5 two, two at 25. Next year, we may be looking at numbers more like 25 K through 30. And as we've been meeting, Mr. Gray and myself are meeting with our principals privately. What's happening is we already have, for example, one report over at Ellsworth that we're going to have classes of 27 at the start of the school year uh, if we don't do anything just because of the numbers of kids who have come up. Quick parenthetical statement on that Dr. Belusky has been spearheading um, a redistricting and enrollment. Uh, Project. We've had a demographer come in who's very well respected in the field. Shelter Rock School is projected to grow by 57%. That's a staggering number that will have huge implications for this. Again, we're going to have a reduction in administrative support to teachers throughout the district. Last year, we went through a major reorganization. We dramatically downsized central administration. We've cut professional development, as I said. Uh, reduced or elimination of programming for the middle schools. Family and consumer science will be eliminated. Technology education will be eliminated, the possibility of world language being eliminated, and reduction or elimination of high school electives because we just don't have the resources to do that. Full day kindergarten is on the chopping block right now. Uh, we've been talking about this for some time, just so the council members understand the dynamic. In every school, we have at least one full day kindergarten, the rest of the half day kindergarten programs. We're talking about going to universal half day care. We will be doing a full day kindergarten for any parents or children, and with that comes the elimination of 11 paraprofessionals who support the kindergarten program. Closing and restructuring millage, as we mentioned, implementation of a K to participate at the high school level for athletics and co curriculum. It's important to understand there's a difference here. This is not pay to play. This is pay to play, the athletics piece, as well as, as a, having a fee levy to be in the school play, in the band, in the chess club, in any of the um, extracurricular activities, co-curricular activities. Again, we talked about the administrative positions, the custodial positions, possibly reducing the school bus. How does that play out? It means that the walking distance, the radius gets larger, so kids will have farther to walk to school. 
and uh, we've already identified reduction in secretary services. Uh, and some of our kids. The district added a new curriculum to the Ministry of High School. This is out there in the community. We're not sure why. Uh, in reality, uh, that's false. What we did was we took the position of associate principal, and this is going to be played out to a hand. We had one principal, one associate principal, we had three years, and four assistant principals. That was last year, the year before, the year before. So this year, we had one principal, one associate principal, and four assistant principals. We did not have anybody new other than the person who assumed the role, uh, in an existing role. The associate principal that we had for many years was Ed Whalen, we uh, know Mr. Whalen. When he retired, we replaced his associate principal position, but we increased it with an emphasis on instruction at the 612 level. Historically, that position has been 912. Although we added um, four more, three more schools, so it's now this, Mr. Riley's former place, and Gordon Newton Rogers Park, uh, there's no additional compensation for that job. So the job got bigger. There was no, adi no additional job put into place. We focused it around instruction because the Cambridge report came in saying we had a heavy focus on that. The NEOSP report, which is the new and the team that comes in, the credits high school, so we can work on that. And the attorney, our board members, central administration, as well as our staff members said we need more political articulation from the middle school level to the high school level. So that position was recrafted in 612. So clearly false that there, there was no additional person put in. It was just as we had one person retire, we replaced that position. Great cool ask. Um, uh, significant cost avoidance. And Mr. Long is going to be speaking to this in, in a little while. And, um, uh, it's true, we did, there are substantial areas that we looked at. So where we couldn't actually sa um, uh, save money, we avoided expenses by, by being creative. Um, I can't tell you how many times the council said think out of the box. You'll see tonight how many times we've thought out of the box with good results. Um, our approach with the bargaining units, we went to the middle of that, of our 11 unions. Uh, Mr. Gray has been very aggressive in working with them. Um, Negotiated 0% increases already with two of those groups. Negotiations are ongoing with the other groups and we're seeking to have similar results. Uh, these are ongoing negotiations, so obviously we can't talk too much about it. But negotiated two furlough days. The administrative union came forward and said we will give you back two of our days. Uh, we requested furlough days for next school year for teachers and administrative group. Uh, they were declined to negotiate. Uh, you know, for the reasons that the unions have stated, uh, in part because we've already given back two days, in part because um, we too, which is fair to balance the entire budget on one particular bargaining group or in our groups. Um, negotiated significant give backs on our insurance costs, we have major savings there, and in a sense, we've really played one against the other, Sigma against Anthem, and it's typical uh, competitive process that many districts use. We've had great success with that uh, through Mr. Longo's efforts. We requested midterm bargaining regarding the increase in total student growth at the middle school level. The request was declined. So what we mean by that is just cap of 125 students for teacher for most teachers at the middle school level. We've asked some teachers, a special subject, to double that one. We put them on a cyclical basis. So at any given at any given time they have 125 kids in total they got 250. What happens though is they have that many papers to grade, um, that many more projects to review, that many more kids and families to be to work, et cetera. It was a, a daunting request that we had that we tried again to think out of the box a little bit. And then requested concessions from the bargaining group for next year. Um, this piece is a little bit trickier. I'll see if I can leave all the education speak out of it. Um, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act has been around for decades. The most current incarnation of that, semi uh, most current, is No Child Left Behind. That's the Elementary Secondary Education Act, ESEA, George Bush's initiative. That is going to be a thing of the past and it's going to be replaced by Race to the Top with the Obama administration. But the idea is it's still part of ESEA. And with that comes uh, accountability faction. But beyond that, if the entire ESEA federal legislation went away, Connecticut passed a law around something called calorie, Connecticut Accountability for Learning Initiative, that 
Connecticut accountability for when the legislation says, regardless of what Washington does, we are holding 169 schools in Connecticut stringently accountable to the targets that we set over, over a period of time. The growth model, that's why we look at four or five year increments. There are stringent performance improvement expectations that the State Department of Education is making. The reason being, uh, sometime back a few years ago, 12 districts and 12 course districts in Connecticut were identified as districts in the UQ. I hate this term, but it's the, kind of a street term for it, the failing school systems. And as you might imagine, there was a well-known, um, here's a well-known uh, researcher who did a well-known study that said, Tell me the social economic level of any given community anywhere in the country, don't tell me the community, and I will tell you how the test scores are. He did it over 100 times, Ted Sizer from the University, and he was accurate 100% of the time. And if you look at the demographic profiles, the lowest performing districts are the poorest, and the highest achieving districts are the most affluent. They have educational reference groups, which are now broken out by districts or DRGs. DRG A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. I is the poorest, A is the most affluent. Danbury is H, second to the poorest. The 12 districts that went are districts I and district H. Those 12 districts last year were joined by three others, and Sonia, Stanford, and Danbury. We were able, although we're the seventh largest district in the state, we were able to outperform any other school systems and we were identified in the second round. But we were identified in the second round. What that means now is that the State Department of Education's ad hoc committee that is chaired by the state, uh, one of the, the state board uh, reps, and the Commissioner of Education now have us under their tutelage in a sense, and we are held accountable to those folks as well as to the Board of uh, Education. We have to periodically go up there and make a formal presentation to them, and they're monitoring our progress over a number of years. We have submitted a plan that was approved by them. It sounds outrageous, but it's true. They have the authority, the commissioner has the authority, he doesn't like this going on. He's going to replace the superintendent and the entire board of education to dissolve them. And you may have heard about this in the law. As it came in, you might be so and took him on notice. You will change everything you're doing. Uh, we'll come back in time to dissolve this board and the superintendent. And the board said, we understand what you're saying, and they revamped the entire process. We learned from that, because we weren't identified at that time. They were identified in much earlier. And so we recognize the legal authority that comes from the plan. What does all this mean? We now have a district enhancement plan that's approved by the Commission of State Board of Education. Late May, early June, we will have to go back up there and report on our progress. There are, it's a very, very lengthy plan, and we're happy to give it to you. There are hundreds of methods throughout that plan that are being monitored by our own board and internally by administration and by the State Board of Education. If you don't show enough growth, they come in and they basically take us over. We believe that we will be able to demonstrate the growth from that earlier slide that I showed you, all of our test scores, three through eight, every school, every grade, every very tested poem. They're thrilled with the progress we've made, and we are too. But we want to share these two pieces with you so that you can see we're on the same side as you are, we recognize that, and we're with you 100%, and we recognize that these are all challenging that we can be you too. And this is that albatross hanging on the so we will everything in our power to make it work. But we would be lying to you if we would say that the school system will not be fundamentally changed by school. Again, our kids, our kids. Thank you. 
four tenths position of counseling administrator, value of 40,000. To reduce one central district level secretary by shifting the cost of the position to two grant funds. The top mm -hmm. grant, which is Teaching American History Grant, and IDIA. For a transfer savings of 55000 A partial shift of a bilingual administrator position, value of $50,000. Post eliminate financial support to even start, value of $100,000. And to reduce our professional development account by $55,000, pardon me. Cumulative value is four tenths of the position, total value of $300,000. And as Dr. Glass first presentation, the 3.8% budget as requested by the Board of Education calls for a reduction in staff of 8.4. The 8.4 is made up of 5.0 teaching positions, 2.4 administrators, and one custodial position. For an approximate net savings or cost reductions of a million dollars. Yes. Second, how to hand out to this evening. This is how the Board of Education's mayor's recommended budget of 1.79% increase. Starting at the board's request of 3.8 or $116.1 million. And the mayor's recommended budget of $113.9 million. Leaves the Board of Education with an additional $2,268,000 of costs to address. At this hour, we propose the following reductions to meet the mayor's recommended budget. At the elementary level, we have the universal half-day kindergarten, which calls for elimination of 5.5 certified teaching positions and 11 pure professionals, total value of $770,000. Close to restructure, Mill Ridge Intermediate School. We call for the elimination of a principal position, one secretary, 25 math specialists, 1.0 media specialists, 1.0 language arts, 1.0 nurse, and 2.0 custodial positions. Aggregate value is 6.5 positions, part of the restructuring of MRI, value of $550,000. The restructure of MRI involves pushing the, the KISI campus as well. Restructuring calls for third grade, a third grade remains at the primary school levels. We would restructure and close MRI, transferring fourth and fifth grades to Key Street Intermediate. In turn, we would release one principal and add one assistant principal. That's interrupting, but you mean close the school completely? Or just district the students? There, we, we would transfer our students to King Street Intermediate. The building could remain open and be used for um, Dr. Well, I mean, the, 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 uh, I don't understand the AC. Let me do that. What that really is for the doctor, uh, Dabuski, he's here from somewhere, right? Uh, uh, is that a committee and they've been looking at redistricting because of the um, this Columbus program, which is Head Start, was to leave the district and leaving us with about 12 or 14 classrooms uh, uh, open. We did, uh, the Michael looked at our, our numbers and, and he's been looking at redistricting. In the course of looking at the redistricting, we came up against the, the challenges of this budget and uh, the conversation started talking about, well, what if we use it for another purpose? And what would that purpose be? The conversation right now is important to consider relocating the fourth and fifth graders and the school remain open for the staff there because their other childhood program will still be there along with some of our other programs that will be, uh, will be relocated there. And then the board is going to have to commission another group to look at a long term how we're going to deal with some of the impact stuff that are happening in Rome, particularly at the middle school. So it's not closed, it's just restructuring the fourth and fifth and third field to the next cycle. Which has not been voted on by the board for this consideration. Reduction calls for the elimination or to eliminate dual languages, 7.7 FTEs, technical <coughs> education program at 2.0 FTEs, family consumer science 2.0, and to reduce art by 
Total faculty, 13.7, for a value of $960,000. We also proposed not to fill a supervisor team custodian position, which is vacant today at middle school, value $65,000. Uh, we would have a, an added cost in terms of supervision during the lunch period. Uh, we proposed to have uh, 10 part-time individuals and possibly three hours per day for an added cost of $20,000. At the middle school level, the proposal calls for a reduction of 14.7 FTEs approximately $1 million. The high school level calls reduction of three in every high school classroom for teachers, value $210,000. And to impose and implement a potpourri clean activity fee for 1,000 estimated participants <coughs> and a flat fee of $60 per participant, $60,000. Point zero FTEs at the high school level, still with a value of 270000 At the district cabinet level, we have identified Bureau of Special Education grant dollars that the federal government is able to the City of Danbury and the Board of Education for the next fiscal year, a value of $220,000. We've been successful to date through high and competitive bidding our current vendor Cigna, with Anthem, we reduced on uh, the initial proposal of approximately 12 to 13 percent renewal. Today we're closer down to about seven to seven and a half percent, and we're not done. I believe that uh, within the next week or so we can uh, realize an additional two hundred thousand dollars of savings for the bottom line for the insurance community. Labor settlements, as presented by Dr. Glass through Mr. Bray's efforts, settlements that we can book as of today. We settled contracts at a cost savings of $70,000 when compared to the set aside book for next year's budget. And we propose to reduce one school bus value to $60,000. So the district wide level reduction to $550,000. Our union labor, unionized labor. For which groups? Yeah. All right, I'm going to turn to Mr. Bray because I'm not sure which have, have settled and which can speak. Uh, the seventy, I'm sorry, the seventy thousand dollars of labor labor settlements. First of all, there are two labor settlements for next year. This particular savings is regarding a, a issue which now has been settled, but I am not at liberty to disclose that because the tender agreement is not inside. Okay. But it, obviously, by the time the Executive Council votes, it will be a bit inside. Is there any So basically, what I put on the gathering is the doing here. So the difference between the uh, BOE's approved budget and then what the mayor's going to give you is only an additional one point one million dollar cut. No, it's an additional two point uh, three million dollar cut from the boards. Well, if you take if you take the three point eight one percent, yes, sir. If it's one seventeen. But you're already doing the one million anyway. We're doing the one million anyway. Right. Regardless. Re regardless, we're going to do the one million anyway. All right, so now we're down to 116. Mm -hmm. Then we take then we're going to 116. Down to 113. Which required an additional 2.3 million. Okay. 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 The board uh, the board's 3.8%. Superintendent, as a member of cabinet, that we were given the directive by the Board of Education to stay clear of the classroom. Wherever and whenever possible, stay away from the classroom, trip elsewhere. And we believe we were quite successful addressing the first million dollars of cuts with eight, approximately eight actions. Unfortunately, when we move south of the 3.8, and we're looking at closer to 1.5, there's little outside areas 
that remain without having a direct impact to the classroom. On page two, we'll identify, you'll see that for a ratio of every six employees that we must uh, let go, reduce. There is the additional cost of hearing the employee, employee for unemployment. We are self-funded, I believe as municipalities as well, which means the dollar we pay are responsible for dollar for dollar for unemployment costs. So throughout our budget process, we have earmarked on a ratio of one to six. For every six FTEs, there's a seventh position that must be invested. The unemployment set aside for additional seven and a half which is tied to the board's 3.8, moving to the 1.8, calls for an unemployment set aside of $525,000. The board is currently considering an ERIC program for its administrators. We had an extremely successful ERIC program last year for our teachers and a subset of our administrators. Uh, the board is currently considering uh, a ERIC for administrators, uh, which would uh, theory a cost of $80,000. Can you explain what that is? Yes, early retirement center. It's part of the restructuring in order to accommodate a 1.8% budget. We propose to um, have a department head for grade 6 through 12 council, which would be a stipend position of $7,000. Earlier, the board cut four tenths of the council administrator down to $40,000. The seven thousand dollars now is a buyback against the forty thousand dollars savings. So effectively, we want to save thirty-three thousand dollars. Cutting forty, but we will offer now uh, the uh, stipend of seven thousand dollars and have the department head for six sixty twelve council. As the board is faced with many challenges to address a one point eight budget versus its recommended budget to the mayor for three point eight percent, the board proposes this to be the superintendent proposes to the to restore the gifted and talented programs at the elementary and middle school levels. So while they appear as reductions or cuts under the board 3.8, should there, well, there will be any cuts under 1.8, because apparently 1.8 is the maximum value that the board will, 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 will likely see in next year's budget. We propose now to restore the gifted and talented at elementary and middle school. And given the great number of FTE cuts at the middle school level in terms of world languages, tech education, and other program areas, we propose to restore the middle school instructional coach. The net impact, moving from a 3.8% budget request to a 1.8% recommended, recommended budget, is 36.7 FTEs valued approximately $2.3 million. Now, to understand the cumulative effect, the board reduced its budget by $1 million. Today, we're faced with a possible reduction of an additional $2.3 million. The cumulative effect of 4.8% required budget to carry forward programs and services as they are today in the fiscal year and to target a 1.8% outcome will call for a total of 26.7 teaching positions, 2.4 administrators, 11 peer professionals, 4 custodians, and 1 nurse for a total reduction of FTEs of approximately 45 positions. When you say 26.7 teacher positions, do you mean positions that are people? In, 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 all, in all likelihood, this time we're looking at people. Last year we were going to say how many people? Dr. Sal or Mr. Brinkley? Um, last year, as you know, we had a very large number of retirees. Uh, this year, obviously, we have a number of going one year, you far fewer. Uh, at this point, I believe we only know three, but we do not expect more than seven. So, and also, you should know that whether or not a person can then take that job is very much contingent upon the certification of the teacher. So I may have an elementary school teacher retired and I'm cutting middle school teacher. You can't have that job unless they have that.
Yeah, if I may. Um, so, for instance, the middle school teacher who now is without a position would also need to then carry the elementary school certification, and of course, that was supported. And uh, given that there will be no vacancies in elementary school, which will also come in elementary positions, it's very likely that probably all of that 26.7, but maybe a couple less, uh, I'd say at least 25 teachers will come back. Thank you. Uh, to the chair, Elio. Um, at, at this time, or in the upcoming month, month and a half, do you anticipate sending out notices to uh, teachers that have that are not tenured, uh, et cetera? Have you anticipated doing that already? Mr. Mr. Brazos. Sure, absolutely. The way um, we did it this year in Vice Park Council was we did, of course, send on renewal uh, notices to, uh, to teachers who uh, would not be for performance reasons. However, we have not proceeded with sending out notices for contract termination based on job losses. We will be doing that, as you said, probably in the next month or so. We won't do that until the board ultimately adopts whatever they're going to adopt. However, we are working through the union and we will be identifying who those people will ultimately be, assuming that you were to approve the mayor's budget. Follow up, please. Would you, do you, would you at this time uh, have an idea how many actual teachers would, let's say, be let, let go? Yeah, I think it's going to be somewhere between 24 and 26 actual teachers. It's going to go high. It is, well, that's, our number is 26.7. We have only three retirements, and we believe a maximum of seven. And the problem is, since we're cutting at several different levels, we don't we don't believe there's going to be the ability to move people around that we had last year. These would these be most likely non-tenured teachers? Sure. If we hired. Um, it will all come out of essentially the people who were hired for the last two years. Thank you. Um, I noticed there was the negotiations with the unions. There's 11 unions. 11 union negotiations. 11 unions that are in process of negotiation. Two have been settled for supposedly settled with the seventy thousand dollars savings. What about the other nine? Okay, there's a, there's seven unions uh, total. The all of them, uh, with the exception of the food service, are both there. We are negotiating with the Secretary Union uh, contract expires this year. We will begin negotiations with them. The custodial union uh, just had their reopener negotiations, uh, but we have not ratified that yet. I think there is a technical agreement on that. The paraprofessionals union, and we've been in active negotiations for a new three-year contract, uh, but that also isn't, you know, there is no technical agreement at this time, although I believe negotiations have been included. The teachers union um, is, has another year on their contract, but we will begin negotiations in the summer for the following year. The administrators union, as you know, with the board did ratify the agreement, which was rejected by the council a couple weeks ago. So I'm getting that as five. The nurses union is in negotiations with us for a reopener for next year's wages. Um, that is ongoing and there is no settlement on that. I guess the other one is the food service union. The food service union did uh, give us a increase. They, they ultimately have a 0% increase for next year and a 2% increase this year. So that is a settled and ratified contract. That's where it's all standing. Mr. Mayor, you said you had a question. If you cut 26.7, How many of those positions and what would be their impact on the Connecticut accountability ruling legislation? That would be the first two that I've been last time talking about Sparrow. I'll tell you that um, to a principal of our 14 elementary schools, there is not one that's not concerned about regression in our test scores. As I mentioned, we've had four years of public improvement some very significant growth as well. But um, with the elimination of the 17 
like a computer specialist. Um, it would be really felt the impact issue. Secondly, as you take those 26 and change positions, you're looking maybe four or five at the elementary level. What that will do will drive up our class sizes. And it doesn't seem like much to go from 22 to 25 or 23 to 27. But as I share with parents, if you have three children, and we just give them two more, you know how much bigger a job that is. Two or three or four more kids in the classroom is enormous, especially in some of the classrooms that are very tight, like South Street School. There are some rooms where you have to walk like this between the desks just to get from one side of the room. Right? So we're not doing room, but we are predicting that there is possible, a strong possibility that there might be a regression in the test rooms. So that, um, if I understand correctly, then um, I think is that there will be funds for people that are teaching those subjects that come under this organization. In part, at the elementary level, there's only one classroom teacher, and those are the folks that we fill. Um, we have no other place to go anymore. Mr. Fazio said that. We took this model of the bullseye, we started with the child in the middle, the next closest person is the classroom teacher. And out the concentric circles, they started coming from the outside in. But after the 0% uh, allocation, it took us way in. Now we have nowhere else to go, but we're starting to cut, to cut the core programs. At the middle school level, the cuts will not be with teachers who are teaching in Connecticut master test subjects. It will be possibly elimination of French and Spanish for kids. Technology education, the old home, uh, industrial arts, young consumer science, and the old home act. Those programs will be eliminated. And if they're not tested, same thing in the high school, we'll cut that. Uh, and just to, just to be clear, I, that's kind of where I was going with this. And um, not to single out home act because <coughs> some of our chefs come from, and I do like to eat. I was wondering if that is where those cuts would be coming from to try to protect these jobs. And it sounds to me like that's kind of what you In part, it's a little bit more technical. At the middle school level, we have clusters. English, math, science, social studies, we need 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, 125 kids. Between them, <coughs> the youngsters rotate between those five teachers. If you cut the teacher mm -hmm. in, there's no place for those kids to go. But when you look at the special subject areas, we can decrease in the, the special subjects, meaning art, music, physical education, et cetera. We can, we can decrease in those areas and possibly eliminate the after without taking the pain of the pool. And so as I mentioned earlier, the reason we're suggesting that we're starting to, the process of transforming into more of a larger urban looks like, the large urban's many years ago eliminated all these peripheral areas basically being run the map as the heart of their district to hold it on. So we're trying to protect the, the most mission critical components of our school system, but at the same time we recognize we're preparing down that 360, that whole list of approaches that we've always had. I like you too, by the way. I'm sorry? I like you too, by the way. <laughs> This one a little bit more tricky because um, it's just a little quick preface. I think we all get weeping eye every four years when the president runs for election. And I know I get weeping eye when, when, when a, a president says something like, it takes a village to raise a child. And, and I'm a great believer of that belief. Um, but I think the villagers are tired. And when you look at it's not that they don't want to have a book of fire. And when you look at that, and I think it was the third chart, I'm not sure. Um, there were a number of jobs there, and, and I, I, know that, but I want to try to give all the information for us. It's marvelous. I'm trying to explore it. But when you look at, and I think it was the third chart that you put up there. You started out with a bunch of jobs that were going to be eliminated, and you can see here, and some of them, and it looked like it came down to two jobs. So I'm trying to get the distance. Yes, the impact is losing jobs. But the bottom line tool in measuring it is how smart, if you will, a lot of that students are going to come The next chart said we were able to raise.
So my first impact, my first life, is a fantastic guy. He's helped people out. Maybe I'm just doing Scott's numbers. It's not that simple, I know. But anyone that sees that, that I'm going to meet on the street, and they're going to come and sit here, I can understand it. You know, they want no money. It's hard for anyone, I think, to grasp that chart and reconcile other jobs and kids with this one. It's, it's, it sounds counterintuitive, but the reality is kind of an easy, easy uh, answer. First of all, as you heard Phil say, we lost more than 50 positions. But because of the early retirement incentive program in the unit, a lot of our folks left. And so we were able to backfill those positions. And part of it was just Lewis and others being as conscientious as they could because of certification. It's illegal for us to put teachers in certain places. We now have to pigeonhole them. We were able to do that, and so only two people lost their job. This year, we're predicting about 24, 25, and 26 people to actually lose their position. Um, secondly, what we have done, is, I want to go off on a philosophical tangent, because it would be an appropriate response, but I'm not kind of sure, but ultimately a community, the village, has to ask itself the question, what do we want education for kids to be in the end? We are becoming a really lagging math industry because that's what we are testing, that's what the accountability legislation holds us accountable to do. It doesn't hold us accountable to have hard core music or family consumer science or technology education all those other things. We as a community have always embraced those. We still do, but there's a reality factor here, and that's why I say it's not us against them or us against you or you against anybody else. <coughs> The community, the community is getting tired financially because we just don't have the resources. So tonight's presentation is to be as accurate and as forthcoming as possible to say, this is the new reality for us. So we want to share that with you. And then next year, as a community, we have to come around this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Against this question, I'm really going to try to refer to either Dr. Glass or Helio. But in your presentation, now I do believe that our education program is the backbone of the community. I think we should do all we can to educate our children. But the cuts that you propose is all within the class. And your presentation is very few cuts were made outside of that classroom at all, in my opinion. And when I look back on a spreadsheet that our finance director proposed, just in the last two years, the Board of Education expenses went up by 11 percent in two years. And our goal here is not necessarily to reduce your spending, but more or less to control growth increase year to year, year to year, year. And you know, last year, I think you know, and the board presented that they wanted 115 million dollars from us, and gave you that zero percent. But if we would have given you that increase of $115 million, with your 3% increase that you want this year, we'll be at $120 million today. So the goal here is not necessarily to try to cut your expenses, but more or less control the growth of those expenses and to where our growth should be. And you know, again, going over this spreadsheet I have here, for example, um, you're budgeting $180,000 for custodial overtime salaries. Why? Why do you need it? Why do you need overtime? The first part of that is so we don't lose it because you're absolutely right. That there was a piece that has been very transparent to everybody. You haven't seen it. We felt it, but we have to be good about getting this done. Um, last year, Helga Jensen got to the rock and one of the four, she was a central office of the she was in charge of science. <coughs> this year, because of cutting central office administrators, she now is in charge of seven departments. Kara Casimiro um, has replaced two uh, English coordinator and a social studies coordinator. We eliminated that and created just one position called the Humanities Curriculum Administrator. So one person took the job in two. Kara um, Ross Daly is now in charge of the STEM area, science, technology, engineering, and math. We eliminated the math coordinator, we eliminated the science coordinator. So we've consolidated with the administrative team that we could to a more outrageous extent 
It's also illegal for us not to have a principal in the buildings. Any of our administrators by law have to be principals because we have to clean schools. We'll downsize by one next year by closing the operation. So part of that uh, is the simple metric that we're required by law. We're required by law to have superintendent. I mean, that, I mean, see, that's where I'm going now. I want to keep that teacher in the classroom. I want to keep those three gander high school teachers in the classroom. How do we do that? I mean, I mean, you have to, the Board of Education has to weigh that option. Is it more important to pay 180000 in custodial overtime, which is, again, after the normal hours, or put a teacher in the classroom? If I had that choice, I would pay the $180,000 to the teachers. And that's where it belongs. It belongs in the classroom. It doesn't belong for $180,000 to go over time, $10,000 for a part time or something. Um, I mean, if you go through this list that we have here, it increases our enormous increases. And these are expenses that are outside of your circle that we presented. It's not the classroom, it's the outer part, it's the custodial, it's the, it's the administrative expenses, the overhead expenses that you did not mention at all. We do so. Yeah. We actually agree with you. Just know that we struggle with this all the time, so we're on the same page. But these fellows can explain to you that why we're going to talk about it. There's plenty of custodial fees. Part of the problem with the custodial fees, we are grossly understaffed. We have not enough custodians to do the job. We have two vacant custodial positions, a night at custodian at the middle schools and a night at custodian at the high school, who also do custodial work. They don't just act as night at custodians. The problem is, if we were to, we have to do a balance again. And we can either hire more custodians at $50,000 a piece with benefits, or we can try to juggle with overtime and temps, which is what we try to do. But ultimately, the union, they have a bargaining group. The bargaining group is entitled to work, and we're very limited in how we can work around that. But we are understaffed by any measure. So that's the answer to your overtime. Well, you have to make a choice then, again, with what the doctor last said, you have to make a choice of how you want your schools to work. Because we have to make a choice of how you want the schools to be clean, or would you rather have an extra teacher, or would you rather have all your schools be clean at night? That's the problem. We've been put in a position where we're making some very tough choices, but we're making them knowing all the facts. Can you explain, I know you mentioned technology services before. Yes, yeah. um, Again, two years ago, that budget was $57,000, and now it's $280,000. Can you explain why that increases the Yes, in large part because of the licensing requirements that we have on our software packages. Uh, we are up to date with all of our licensing fees with Microsoft and other vendors as well. If you recall, a couple of years ago, even before the council for a request to replace switches, well, there are certain maintenance and draft obligations that come along with the bond issue of the time uh, option of the yes technology lease that was proposed. So we have funded the account by approximately $200,000. So you have a contractual obligation? It's contra it's the contractual in the sense is that by, by law, we are required to have it. Um, Certificates on all of our software. Yeah, that's every year. Yes, every year. Can you, can you upgrade your software every year? It's not a matter of upgrading your software. It's, it's, it's a matter of staying in the meeting and compliance. Licensing. Licensing. Okay. So, so the so machine is correct. So it means you have more machines this year. Not necessarily that we have more machines this year. So that's been a catch up that was required of the Board of Education for many of the years. Now, last year, we just Needs to be in compliance. Again, I, I'm going to just pick, again, maintenance, for example, in this list. That is $400,000. <coughs> what are you proposing that you have to maintain? I mean, that, I mean, fine item 4.3. 400000 what's that? What are you maintaining? Our schools, repairs, our custodial maintenance staff, supplies. 
I mean, we take a look, we go kind of back to the custodial issue. The custodial group average is about 70, 75 employees. At a, even an average pay of $50,000, dollars you looking at about $4.5 $4 million cost pool. So when we, when we presented or looked at the percentages, $180,000, $4.5 million allows for a 3% cost overrun in terms of OT. It's not as though we're spending $180,000, which is an absolute term, $180,000, it amounts to you know, $0.25 cents more on the dollar. It amounts to paying $0.03 cents increase per dollar on our current basic employees. But in, this, in, in June of 2009, there was $225,000. We're proposing $400,000 now. So what's, what would cause that large increase? We have many other new contractual obligations. We came before the board on the Honeywell proposal. That's all, That's all built in. And there's no savings in that line item? No. So, there's savings in the utilities line items. I mean, we recognize the best of our ability in all of the efforts that the city and the Board of Education has made over the year in terms of the Honeywell um, basis to recognize and realize cost savings in the utilities. Mr. President? Mr. President? Thank you, Madam if I might, a couple comments. Um, first, uh, <clears throat> I realize that, and I thank you very much for uh, presenting Dr. Glass and all of you for presenting your your uh, viewpoints on what's going on with regard to the budget. Um, I realize that the most important commodity is our children, the children and our students, and that. Uh, uh, we want to do the, all that is possible to give them the best education that we can possibly do. But at the same token, we have to we have to take a hard look at the actual Danbury taxpayer, especially those people that are on fixed incomes. Uh, Social Security uh, benefits this year zero percent. Uh, Retired teachers, uh, uh, less than less than 0.5, less than a half a percent raise. Disabled American veterans, zero percent raises. My point being is that it, it's a very difficult time, and uh, we want to do what's best for the kids, certainly, and, and they they deserve that. But we also have have to think about our our retirees, our people on fixed income, they just can't handle anymore. I mean, we have people that in this area are losing their homes and, and they're having a very difficult time. Now I know that the cabinet level, I know that this cabinet level, you have, you're a brain trust, and I don't mean that uh, to, to mock you or anything like that. But you have the abilities, you have the expertise, and if you are going to be able to lower the budget, you can do it without cutting teachers from the classroom. I know you can. It's just a matter of going and looking, as my peer uh, has said, about certain things where you can cut. And another thing, I, I just hope that whatever it happens, I just hope that we insulate the young kids, the young students from, you know, hearing or receiving uh, anything that might be sent home to the parents that would give them a sense of insecurity while they're in school. I mean, it's one thing if, if we, we come out on, in the media or whatever, and you say, well, things are tough. But I know that in the past, in my 34 years, there have been times that, uh, not you gentlemen at all, I know you would do this, have sent home letters attesting to, we're going to cut teachers, we're going to do this, and, and the younger children cannot and should not be able to handle that and they become very excited. We don't want that to happen. So it behooves you and us to make sure that those things like that don't happen because the most important commodity, again, is the children. And no matter what we fix the budget at, you as a brain trust, you have to deal with it and you have to make it work without cutting teachers out and without cutting teachers out of the classroom. 
So am I correct in assuming, because this wasn't clear at the beginning of the presentation, that these particular plans or these options have been cleared by hard floor, they don't need to be cleared by hard floor, in particular MRI closing? They don't have to be cleared by hard floor. But our understanding is that how the floor is an increase in our test scores. That's the bottom line right here. So we can close the school or not without the hard floor closing? Right. Other additional consideration on the turnouts here states that the city is one of 15 school systems being in need of improvement on Connecticut accountability for learning legislation. Does that mean we have schools that are in actual failure in the city? We have those schools that are tied around are the ones that are governed by that law. Our high school is, even though it's not tied around, of course, the trauma that we do. So we have schools that are in need of improvement. Moore Street School was the first identified. It's out of that realm. Others are in that realm. I think we have four. It's a great question. There's a piece, I think, that's very important to realize. And it's another one of those hidden kind of things. The Obama administration recognizes that there were major flaws in No Child Left Behind. The legislative package has started identifying schools as failing schools or schools in need of improvement. Currently, the newest finding, which was predicted before, is that this No Child Left Behind legislation continued forward to its termination date of 2014. 100% of the schools in the United States would be identified as schools in need of improvement. It was a ridiculous, it was a great program in terms of mobility, this No Child Behind. But in terms of the metrics that they use, kids just don't grow. You have to go 4% this year, and you have to go 2%, and you have to go 3%. It just doesn't happen that way. So the other thing I think that's critical with that, as Sal said, Moore Street School. I don't know of any other school in the state. I believe there are a couple others. But Moore Street School was the first school in this county that came off the list, which is unprecedented, and grew so much. The Lone Pine Foundation recognized them for excellence as being the first in the Fairfield County area of all the schools in the Fairfield County. So the work that's being done is very smart, very mindful. The problem is, and again, I just want to go back to what Mr. Bradley said. We really get the idea that everybody's buckling under the weight of this economic environment. And so we're not coming here saying, please give us more money. We're just saying that we're grateful for the 1.8%, and we're just trying to hold tight to everything we possibly can that's kind of sacred for us. So in the spirit of total transparency, we want to make it evident what our plans are about what these tasks and stuff that has to first go before the board and decide, ultimately, we do this, we don't do that. But what you saw here is a pretty good prediction of what we need to do. 100% may not come true, but I say about 90% of what we saw is going to actually happen. Thank you. 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 Thank
like you to see where projected growth in the future would probably come from. And we've had a committee of about 15, 18 people uh, consisting of several principals at the elementary and middle school level. Um, we had central office, white staff, for example, special education, Mr. Longo, uh, transportation office, and we had about uh, six or seven parents you know, who worked with us over the last several months. We had any teachers part of that group? No, teachers were not as part, uh, part of this uh, particular group. Because we're not focusing on any one particular school, we were approaching it more from a space issue, not a program issue, but a space issue. Um, as we proceeded, we looked at various options. Uh, what could be done. We had to find a building that would be large enough uh, to house a very good school. <coughs> and that's eventually what drove the entire planning process. Uh, Danbury will need a very good school. Once again, we know we're not going to get the money for the building. Uh, we had to look at which building could accommodate it. And we kind of broke it down into a two-step process. First, we said to ourselves, what can we do in the immediate future to stop that process going? Second part was to look at a more of a long range process, uh, given the demographic information that we have. I believe Dr. Sal mentioned um, earlier uh, at the elementary level, the numbers are all over the place. Uh, Shelter Rock is projected to grow by about 57%, and some schools like Great Plain will lose 16%. Uh, so, what we really looked at and worked with was the what could we do to recommend to the school board for September as option one? And option two would be during the next, the next school year to start a long range planning process of a redistricting of the entire city. Uh, most school districts have to redistrict every seven to eight years as a national average. Amory has not redistricted for the past 16, 17 years. So we're way overdue, and the demographics that are coming in now uh, are really in the way. The, the big issue, we get back to the specific question about no races, one was the size of the building. Uh, two was the proximity to King Street Elementary Campus, as you know, the contiguous uh, boundaries uh, for ease of student movement. Another fact we looked at would be the least disruptive plan for September, these number of students uh, you know, move. And uh, by a process of elimination, we played uh, out different scenarios. And Millbridge was the one that made the most sense uh, because that would be the school most likely located that could accommodate the third of the school, which would be at Pat Wilson, and not that far down the road to accommodate our Right, that's where most of the, uh, the SR classes, there are five SR classes uh, currently in that building. So, excuse me, when we're at, am I accurate in saying this is more a planning decision versus a budgetary decision? Uh, it began originally to be honest with you as a planning decision. But obviously, as we got into the budget uh, scenario, uh, it became obvious uh, that there could be some cost savings the next year for the school board if the board should, uh, chooses to go uh, down this road. As Dr. Sal indicated, the board does not formally approve this. Uh, yes, I said before. Yeah, they're aware of it, because uh, we've been reporting to them what the committee has been working on. Uh, but there's been no board decision on whether or not uh, this would happen. The only ones we put on that was the criteria. If we don't do that, then we have to theoretically make more, more positions. So by doing that, we just move everything and save those positions so that we see a fact. If we were to increase your budget, now I'm not saying the 2.2 million that we thought about. If you were to increase it, say, by 500,000 or 600,000, what program do you use for? I'm going to have to help with that. I just don't understand. We give you, you, you not the, not the, uh, the mayor's budget. We give you $600,000 more for you. Well, I know what the mayor would We recommend giving you pay. What we would do, we would go look at the teaching position. Uh, you know, I am not enamored with uh, losing the electives at the middle school. I think those youngsters should have those um, experiences. It's important. We already got to pair it back. Uh, I think we should look at uh, the class size uh, issue at the secondary level. Uh, we, when when uh, the group retired last year, many courses were not um, supported. And there are more students in study halls where we don't want to see them. So we would. Uh, from our criteria, the lens we would look at is how do we put people back in. Uh, 
500,000 wouldn't do it. We'd have to weigh the, the value of how many, the least impact of the full day kindergarten versus uh, the electives at the middle school. But we would put teaching positions back. That would be one of the first questions I would have the board look at. Is it, is it possible that we need to do to put together packages of 500,000 packages if we were to give you five X, Y, and Z or something? I don't want to try, let me try to answer it. Let me try to answer it this way if it makes any sense. If you look at the original budget that we recommended, it's it cuts it directly, but not on the second round. Cuts because it didn't it didn't work out the way it should be relative to um, supporting the programs that we have. If you gave me chunks of five hundred thousand, what would I do? And it's a matter of just going to here and say, I'm telling you, we put teachers in the classroom as often as we can. Would support the work that's going on in the classroom with materials and supplies, uh, and then we add it back in. We would put it in other areas. The board is very concerned. If you look at that sheet there, the six thousand dollars proposed curricular activity. You might ask, where did the sixty from? What was on the table was the conversation it was uh, because of the city programs in ninth grade. Maybe we don't have ninth grade experience second at the high school, and then let the city take care of that and the kids play get the week people of ours and gym people. That's how we came up with that. That doesn't make us feel good because we know that our kids need to be connected. They start out in the United States. They look forward to the tradition. I look at all those things and try to give our kids a well-balanced 360 experience Dr. last month. I don't see other things going in there. The textbook thing is an issue, but I don't increase that, no. Because it is where it is, but I go look at trying to give our kids the right experiences. Uh, and given we have people that are working, and, you know, you looked at that overtime thing. It, it annoys the heck out of us as well. And, and that's one of those areas that goes one way. We just have custodians out. They have a lot of accumulated days. We have to pay. He has to make transfers in there. So when we look at some of these accounts, they're based on some uh, some history as well. But I, I try to keep those just just so that we don't go into later on in the year and take away from programs. That's why they're staffed at that level. But I put money back to teachers and my cat will uh, support that, I'm sure. I, 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 I need to ask a question. I don't need to get off track from Charlie Denise's question, but during your budget uh, meetings that you had in the board of that over here, but, um, you talked about teachers at the end of the year putting in for supplies that you either receive and then they get paid at the end of the year. Has the procedural process changed in that? I mean, I've never heard of like that, that nobody oversees what the teachers are buying, but by the end of the year they hand in the receipts and then they get reimbursed for what they spent. <laughs> 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 I've got some teachers. I mean, I will, I will be the first to tell you as they go around, and I want to thank you. They go out and supply a lot. I haven't seen any receipts to me saying, Would you please pay for this construction paper. Joe, Colleen, you, you haven't lost it. It probably was a comment that I made. Um, you know, I would say on average, this is math for me. You guys came back to the board last year and asked for more money. Well, I, I think it was my comment that may have kind of sent you off the wrong direction. My fault. What I, what I shared was, on average, I would say our teachers spend anywhere between 800 1300 dollars maybe $2,000 a year out of their own pockets that we don't reimburse. They just do it. When I was teaching, I always did the same thing. They don't ask for reimbursement either. But if we were to reimburse them, we would have hundreds and hundreds of people coming forward. So we could put two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 more into our structure supply account to pay for what we spend out of their pockets. But that is not a proposal. That's just what teachers tend to do. It's kind of that's our brief. That's just the point. They would like that, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Do you have any other questions? I think this is your problem. I have a question for that. Thank you. Um, here comes the 800 pound gorilla in the room. And I want to direct my question to you, to the director of the finance and school board. And I mean this with no disrespect to any teachers that are here tonight. But what I want to know from Mr. Longo is, Teachers Union would have graciously stepped forward and offered to suspend a step this year. What would be the cost savings to the Board of Education? 
Right. You have to step into the rays. I'm sorry? You mean the rays before they step? Step. 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 You actually mean the step. about suspending a step. Okay. Not passing it, just suspending it out of the air. I believe the average step would be corrected by one third, possibly one point two, one point three percent. I believe so. I don't have that data with me, but I think that's it's safe to, to have that take at about one point three percent. One point three percent on approximately fifty to fifty five million dollar pool would amount somewhere between about six six hundred fifty thousand dollars. I should also point out that the teachers um, last year we did have the, the year we're in now we have we froze steps this year. Next year there will be more. Did you have some final comments with the new tax? Will that be a proposal to speak to you? Talk to people who have come and 
lived in shanties and they could speak two languages. And most of us who have grown up in these middle class homes cannot speak one. And it's a known fact. It's been investigated. You teach your children another language that improves their English. I find myself many times teaching a girl language and explaining to students what adjectives are. Because they can't remember. So I'm not only teaching Spanish, I am teaching English. And I think every little language teacher will tell you the same. We are defining what nouns are, what adjectives are, what adverbs are, how to conjugate words. We apply and we make connections. We always make connections. That's part of the Connecticut standards and the federal standards. We have to make connections with the other subject matter. So I find it very disturbing to take away the right language. Not to mention that I made this portion of the very three of them in college, and every one of them needed three years of the world language entry in college. Because my students were high on my children were high on the students. And every one of them who went to college needed three years of the world language to say. If take away the assignment and make them you are inundating the 9th to 12th grade world language teachers. You're those children who finish and decide at the end of seventh grade break, I gave you two years, I'm going to go to technical school or I decided some college and will accept two years. But most college. Appreciate your comment. Thank you. Tears 
I'm a Churchill, and I believe in kids. And they should be given every opportunity that they can possibly give. That man and that man, amongst <coughs> others, have come out in support of the kids, and I think they should be listened to. I just encourage you to listen to those two men as they fight for teachers in the classroom with fewer students per teacher. I should end it right there, I suppose. Thank you very much. I just want to say one thing that also as a council, we cannot change any line item on this budget. We don't have that authority. So when you say that we can cut you know, electives or the kindergarten, that is not our purview to do so. That's the Board of Ed's job to do so. All we do is just give you that one month. So let you know what our job would be. So we don't tell them how to spend it. We just give them the total money. I'll take one last comment, please.
we're going into a global economy. The whole purpose of the Magnus Fund was to address the fact that we're no, we understand that the world is turning global with the advent of, of information. So why then, I ask, are we cutting foreign languages when that's going to be one of the biggest things we're going to need in order to be competitive in the market moving forward? When we're talking about home ec too, budgeting. Where the kids are going to learn how to budget? Oh, I should say, maybe you can see your board of education. I would be there tomorrow, but I just want to see. You know, but I'm just saying, though, in the budget, though, and I understand, you know, we're all looking, but everybody's got to get, and as a taxpayer, we have to give a little bit more. As long as we know where our money's going, and it's going to go towards education, I'll be willing to pay more on our taxes. Okay, I just, I just want to, I just want to add something on my own. Of our, of our taxpayer money, I think that uh, our city council believes in education because the biggest part of your tax payer dollars go towards education. Once that money is given over, as Ben said, once we deliver the, the funds over to the Board of Education, we have no say on how the money is spent. So the teachers, the parents need to be in contact with the Board of Education and your administration and go to the meetings and, and, and maybe do some Maybe you can start something up with the parents and get some people in there to help out. I don't know, you might step on some union toes. I don't know. Okay. Uh, but anyway, I refuse to believe that this, the school and this budget is, is running as lean and mean as it possibly can. Um, not fully funding the fourth grade class should come down to teachers' positions, teachers' four positions. I believe the Board of Education is, and its administrators do everything possible to keep teachers in the classroom. We must work together with the funding provided. I guarantee there's money in this budget somewhere. Somewhere. And speaking as a small business owner again, we simply always do more with less. Our employers are the last place we look to make cuts. Families and business are walking a fine line right now, and we must prepare for what the future may throw at us. I urge the school board and this committee to be very careful as we are stewards of our taxpayers' money during these times of uncertainty. And the reality is I will be supporting the mayor's budget this presented. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, Jim, you're
motion has been made. I believe it's been seconded. If, if I may, just a little point of clarification that the education budget, which is inclusive,